Ja. Hello everyone. This is Miriam Naime from Mikas University and the Alan Turing Institute. Welcome to our SuperGen Smart Charging Webinar. We are focusing on cybersecurity in our next episodes, and this is in co collaboration with the International Energy Agency Technology Collaboration Program Task 43 on Vehicle Grid Integration. The webinar is an activity of the Vehicle Grid Integration Group at the Alan Turing Institute. The Turing is the UK <laughs> National Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. And one of the objectives of the Institute is to apply data science to real world problems, such as what we are doing at the Vehicle Integration Group, where we are helping in the transformation of the electricity and transport infrastructure. We've had talks on regional and national uh, rollout plans of electric vehicles, and we also had talks on communication protocols for electric vehicles. You can find the slides and the videos on our landing page and on the YouTube playlist. Now we are focusing on cybersecurity. Electric vehicles are connected to critical national infrastructure, both of them, transport and power, and it is very important to ensure that communication is secure. Now, in this graph that we published recently on communication protocols, we are seeing uh, different entities that are involved in the electric vehicle, vehicle ecosystem. For example, we can see here an electric vehicle connected to an, a, a charger, and that charger is either connected directly to a third-party operator, such as an aggregator, for example, or connected to the third-party operator through an energy management system. And these entities need to exchange information. And it is crucial that this information is secure because there is information such as pricing info that is exchanged, infrastructure um, availability that is exchanged. And we are asking here that people trust the internet to control the charging of their cars. So we, we need to ensure that they have their car ready when they need it. They need to trust the pricing information. But also an electricity network operator need to trust that those chargers are not easily hacked, charged or discharged at full capacity to impact their network. So how can we build that trust? We talked about how a public key infrastructure can be used to secure this electric vehicle ecosystem. A PKI can be used to authenticate the participants, those different entities that we are seeing here, and it can also establish and maintain secure communication. So how do we design a PKI that is suitable for this multi-domain critical infrastructure? But also, how do we ensure 11 playing field where we have massive industries such as car companies collaborating maybe with much smaller industries such as charge point operators. Security is a chain and it is as strong as its weakest link. So we could be securing the front end communication, ISO 15118, for example, but what about the back end communication? Similarly, we could be really securing our communication, but our hardware is not secure. I'm pretty sure Bart is going to cover some of these issues but we also have a series of webinars so that we can understand more about the challenges and possible solutions to secure our EV ecosystem. So uh, without further ado, I'm looking forward to hearing the webinar by Barte, who's Chief International Officer for ELAD. Part of Barte's job is to analyze the long-term effect of electric mobility on electricity grids and help us move to a decarbonized transport future. Um, ELAD is the Knowledge and Innovation Center in the field of smart charging in the Netherlands, and I suggest that you check their websites because they make plenty of really good documents available on the topic. Barte? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Miriam. Trying to stop my shares. Yeah, I'll try to share my screen. 
Yes, welcome everybody. A beautiful day in the Netherlands. Um, uh, a thing I'll be talking about uh, smart charging, which is the core business of um, ELAT. Uh, just introduced by uh, Miriam, ELAT is a collaboration of uh, Dutch DSOs and the national TSO in the Netherlands. So we're uh, founded by grid operators. We have national coverage. And good to, to keep in mind that in the Netherlands, grid operators are unbundled. We are publicly owned. Uh, we have no commercial um, um, goal. And um, uh, two things are very important for us. Of course, we're a DSO and TSO, system operator. So we have to keep the balance in the grid and provide everybody with uh, electricity, prevent black blackouts. But the second thing is very important uh, for us and our shareholders, the provinces and the municipalities in the Netherlands, we have to facilitate the market. And at this uh, moment, the market is in a very big transition. It was mentioned uh, before, um, the energy transition. Uh, so huge uptake of solar energy, heat pumps, but also uh, electric mobility. And uh, ELAT is founded with a focus on e-mobility in the Netherlands, uh, roughly 10 years, um, 10 years ago. We went through different stages the past 10 years. Um, sorry for the Dutch on this, uh, this slide, but the first four years, um, we tried to solve the chicken and egg problem, uh, which everybody, every country had, every uh, uh, municipality in the Netherlands. There were no electric cars because there was no charging infrastructure and there was no charging infrastructure because there were no cars. So we deployed a network of uh, roughly 3000 uh, chargers in the Netherlands. We had a national coverage. You could charge almost in every uh, uh, municipality in every province. And we did this, of course, to help uh, the market with a little push. But the second thing from a grid perspective was to get experience in uh, the rollout. Uh, how should we align our operation to this new product of chargers and e-mobility? And a second thing we had in mind was to learn something about the profiles of electric vehicles. Uh, obviously, they weren't the same as households or uh, industries we've known for over a hundred years. And um, after four years in 2013, uh, we saw there was an uptake in the market. The numbers of um, uh, electric cars evolved and uh, we saw also commercial parties with an interest in uh, deploying chargers. So we stopped rolling out and uh, we've learned from the profiles of our chargers, of our customers with electric vehicles that, well, uh, in those days, everybody simply plugged in when they came home at five o'clock or six o'clock. And um, we had an extra peak on our uh, grids, a peak load, which was, well, quite a challenge, but the numbers of uh, electric cars were very low at that stage. Uh, so we thought, can't we shift the load a little bit? And uh, this could be done. Consumers are open for it. Uh, but you need smart charging and also the standards and protocols for it. Because, well, you have to charge a Tesla at the same way as a BMW or a, or a Renault. And in the Netherlands, you have roughly 16, one, six different charge point operators. So with different grid operators, different types of cars, uh, different types of charge points, there was a need of a little bit of standardization. And this is where we stepped in also second time in the market, not rolling out hardware this time, but uh, helping the market a little bit with a protocol, which is now called OCPP, Open Charge Point Protocol. And um, uh, since last year, we've focused on a, a, a next step in the market, and that's more 
we call it net behavior via smart charging grid operation uh, with smart charging uh, so that's aligning all the new concepts in the energy transition uh, have the the cars charged when there's excess of solar just as is, it is today very sunny in the netherlands or when prices are low or when there's a lot of capacity on the grid um, for example at night um, so the car really has to become a, a, a component of the, uh, the grid um, and new aspects so it's not only about the standards and the protocols but also about well uh, new developments power quality issues uh, of the car uh, vehicle to grid development but also uh, make it safe and secure so cyber security and this is where the PKI uh, uh, comes in. Um, some uh, sense of urgency. Um, these are numbers from uh, April 2020. Uh, at this moment, we have over 200,000 electric vehicles in the Netherlands, and the coming years, so that's the coming uh, two to uh, four years, we expect to have over 1 million electric vehicles um, uh, in the Netherlands. And um, with all these vehicles uh, come a lot of chargers, uh, roughly 1,300 um, fast charging stations. That's the orange uh, charger and, and line you see in this uh, slide. And over 55,000 uh, public and semi-public uh, charging stations and another 150,000 um, uh, private charging stations. So those are the chargers of people at their own driveway or in their own garage. So a lot of cars and a lot of charging, but the market is really uh, speeding up and we expect uh, uh, five times more vehicles and chargers in the coming, um, coming years. As I mentioned, um, uh, this could be a, a challenge for a grid operator uh, if everybody uh, uh, charges at the same time, for example, at five o'clock or six o'clock in the afternoon. So that's the black line. Uh, there's no balance in the grid. And as a grid operator, we have to invest heavily in the grid with extra cables, extra distribution uh, uh, transformers bad for our business case and since we're uh, publicly owned bad also for the inhabitants in the netherlands because well in the end they pay for our investments but the second thing which you should keep in mind is it's also a lot of hassle we have to break the open the streets to reinforce our cables uh, so it's not only the investments it's also a lot of um, uh, trouble so Smart charging is important, and uh, with smart charging, we can also balance the grid uh, by uh, getting a lot of um, uh, solar production on sunny days, like today, off the grid, or uh, relieve the grid when it's very cold in, say, February, uh, and all the heat pumps uh, start heating the houses. Uh, that's the, the, the um, uh, black line on the left. Uh, at night in the morning when there's a peak at say five six o'clock in the morning and all the heat pumps uh, uh, start heating uh, all the houses uh, but in the end we have to facilitate all the, uh, the electric vehicles in the end with uh, with the charging uh, as well and as I mentioned with um, uh, the uptake of electric vehicles where my colleagues uh, did an impact of the total of EV infrastructure in the Netherlands and how much um, uh, grid load there would be. And as you can see, we've taken an average uh, uh, scenario in 2024, uh, 2025, uh, we will reach um, a threshold of three gigawatts um, um, for Europe and uh, we already reached that uh, level of one gigawatts in the Netherlands so if 
um, if people, if attackers, um, malicious people, um, uh, hack our charging station, they really can, um, yeah, cause problems by uh, balancing, imbalancing our electricity supply and demand uh, by turning on and off charging uh, stations on a large scale. Uh, you can damage our network. Um, people can't go to work in the morning because their car isn't uh, uh, charged. But only the financial impact of damaging our assets uh, is very considerable for, uh, for us. And this is only the Netherlands. It's estimated uh, a number of 20 million uh, euros per occasion. Um, so this is from a focus system operation, why there is a need for uh, smart charging. But on the first slide, I also mentioned um, at ELAT, we're not only a system operator, we also have to facilitate the market. And in the Netherlands, uh, this is a typical Dutch street, uh, we really like our interoperability. As far as I know, we're the only country in, in the world at this moment where you can charge uh, at any charging station with one identification card. We have, say, roughly uh, 16, one six different charge point operators, uh, but all aligned consumers can charge uh, anywhere, whether they're driving a Tesla, a BMW, a Renault, a Volkswagen, or uh, Asian brands like Mitsubishi or uh, uh, Hyundai. And this is not only very convenient for uh, the drivers of electric uh, vehicles, it's um, a big push for the market. It's also a big push uh, for, for um, um, new entrants in the, in the markets. And uh, it's a big push for um, innovation and improvement of service and quality. And uh, this is also where the uh, PKI comes in because it also should support interoperability. I'll take you back a little bit in history. Uh, 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 30 years ago, our neighboring country was divided into the west and the east of uh, Germany. And West Germany had an open um, market, while East Germany had a closed market. Um, and there, in East Germany, there was one of, guy, uh, one of a kind uh, state governed uh, direction. While at, um, in the West, there was a lot of um, uh, competition. And we think that is the way it should be. Uh, some cars of 30 years, uh, I all like them. You see a lo very luxurious uh, Mercedes Benz, uh, a very cute and nice um, uh, Volkswagen Beetle, a business car, the BMW, and a racing car, the, the Audi. All uh, cars, well, in a very competitive market, but all known for their quality and uh, targeting specific customers with specific uh, needs. Well, if there's one of a kind, like you had in East Germany, this is the kind of car you get. Um, well, smoky, uh, poor quality, a Trabant, and uh, not really the car you still see um, as, a, as an old timer. And in our opinion at ELAT, the market is evolving uh, in the same way. We should have it open because electric cars are so new um, we should um, benefit from innovation of uh, competitors uh, so new services will evolve on the upper left you see uh, the, the sono motors a car covered with solar panels uh, an avoidable um, um, uh, car the right, everybody knows it, it's a Tesla, it's a luxury car, it's a success, uh, but not everybody can afford it. While in, in the left corner, it's a Hyundai, still expensive, but 
more affordable and uh, good quality. Um, an Asian car brand. And on the right, well, uh, the guy driving is our king. You see he's hitting the curb. Uh, so normally he has his own driver, but he's driving a Renault Zoe. And this was the first um, bi-directional car. So it uh, is really a buffer in the energy grid. The point I'm trying to make with this slide is um, innovation is big. Uh, new car companies evolve, such as Sono and Tesla, uh, with different targets in the markets, different customers, and um, still, well, as a grid operator, we require some things um, um, from them. Um, on power quality, on cyber security. Important, as I mentioned, uh, malicious uh, hardware can really affect our, uh, our, our grids. And one, uh, one step back to the, to the Netherlands, we have over um, um, 30,000 existing uh, full public charging uh, stations and another 25,000 uh, semi-public um, um, charging stations. And they have no cybersecurity requirements at this moment. Um, tendering at this moment is, is very big in the Netherlands since we have to uh, charge over a million uh, electric vehicles in the coming, well, three or four years. And uh, recently, uh, the municipality of Amsterdam, that's uh, MRA, -A, uh, we call it Metropole Region Amsterdam Electric, did a tender of 20,000 uh, charging stations, uh, but without uh, cybersecurity requirements. And it's even worse for the private charging uh, stations uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, we have over 180,000 um, existing private charging uh, points and only the tender of the Rijks, uh, the, the, the national government um, has some cybersecurity requirements. So what we're installing today in the Netherlands uh, will last probably for over uh, 10 years, we expect, maybe even longer. And the hardware we're installing has no cybersecurity requirements at this moment. While, as you've seen in the previous slide, the impact of um, attackers with our charging stations can be very, very uh, big, not only for the customers who can't go to, to the office in the morning, uh, the electric drivers, but also damaging our um, grid. So what we would like to have is cybersecurity on devices. Um, we think uh, a future-proof design uh, oh, um, with a lot of computable uh, power and memory is needed to handle future algorithms and protocols and possible firmware updates. Uh, whenever, and this is my second point, there is an update of cybersecurity, um, it should be uh, easily able to implement on the, um, on the hardware. Current uh, um, um, algorithms and protocols are known and considered uh, sure, but if a vulnerability is found, we should be able to switch to a different one um, overnight. The third point, uh, communication to and from the device should be secured and uh, encrypted, uh, of course. We should create norms and standards regarding resilience and system hardening. Charging stations should, uh, should have unused interfaces disabled and maintenance um, interface secured. Uh, charging stations also should not crash or show any unintended behavior when malicious messages are sent and the infrastructure should be able to detect different format and handle it accordingly. Um, and in the end, uh, we think physical testing of the cybersecurity on devices 
should be done prior to implementation um, in the market, especially in the, the public domain, but maybe uh, also for, uh, for private uh, charging stations if they're, they're really, really uh, uh, big. One drink. And then the cyber uh, security for a public key infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, we have done an, um, um, a conference uh, last fall in, uh, in the Amsterdam Arena and we as uh, uh, ALAD because we thought this was very important uh, cyber security for a PKI. And during this conference, we identified five options for a PKI, uh, a one PKI consortium, multiple PKIs, a certificate trust list, uh, what we call a walking chain of trust, and in the end, the European authority. Well, the most basic option is a one PKI. All market parties share the trust and business to this authority. The customer experience, the cost model, technical solutions, B2B contracts, etc. Because this root certificate authority and this PKI, in fact, is a monopoly, there should be clear and transparent uh, support rules and a neutral and independent regulator. However, uh, the PKI for smart charging at this moment is a global operation. Different countries on different continents have different paces of withdrawal uh, of e-mobility. And visions of governance might vary between countries or even within a sector. The PKI shall be a cross-sector operation with players in automotive, energy, possible banking and internet. Therefore, in the opinion of ELAT, it must be clear that the authority, the root authority, should themselves not be a player in the EV, automotive or energy sector. Because uh, one ally can be a competitor in another market. Um, so the world at this moment is too fragmented uh, for a one PKI uh, solution. In multiple PKIs, um, well, uh, multiple market parties will join as many PKIs as possible. Um, this will result in a federal scheme. In this scheme, market parties will join as many PKIs uh, to have a full market align and original equipment manufacturers uh, adopt multiple routes into their EVs. Um, this has one downfall, the solution may not be scalable since there are limitations on the numbers of routes and certificates to be adopted. Uh, you have to be aware uh, there are a lot of different car brands, only in the Netherlands there are uh, multiple charge point operators. Uh, in Europe we have over uh, 30 uh, uh, countries, so you need a lot of uh, PKIs to to make it work, a lot of computer uh, uh, power. So PKIs can also express their um, uh, trust in each other. When several PKIs coexist, each with their own certification chain, the, they can have an uh, administrative authority uh, evolving with a mission to create, create a unique trust list. This authority keeps the list updated and distributes it to all relevant parties. Charging stations and EVs must be equipped to handle this trust list as a sort of trusted root uh, certificates. But in this system, there are also worries about the uh, uh, scalability of, uh, of the system. Um, for example, the ISO 15118, um, um, OEMs might limit the number of CAs in their EVs and uh, well this might frustrate interoperability which is so important for the customers, the EV drivers in the system. Then the walking chain of trust. 
Large players may require multiple uh, CAs in various uh, geographic regions. Think of the Americas, Europe, Asia. And cross-certification allows different uh, CAs to deploy and maintain trusted relationships. For cross-certification, two operations must be undertaken. First, a trusted relationship between two CAs has to be established. In case of bilateral cross-certification, two CAs secure exchange their verification keys. These are the keys uh, used to verify CA signatures on the certificates. To complete the operation, each CA signs the other CA's verification key um, in a certificate referred as a cross-certificate. Um, and secondly, on the client-side software, the trustworthiness of the user certificates uh, signed by cross-certificate CA should be verified. This is often referred as a walking chain of trust. The chain refers to a list of cross-certification validations that are wa walked or traced from the C uh, certificate authority key of the verifying user to the CA key uh, required to validate the other user's certificate. So a chain is created. Um, but um, um, we must step one step further in our opinion with the European uh, authority. Um, as mentioned, 1511.8 has a limited number of uh, possible CAs in it. And uh, we also mentioned with the slide of the different cars, uh, innovation is good. It should be open for new players, new entrants, uh, such as Sona Motors or Tesla. Uh, new service providers, e-mobility service providers, charge point operators. So on the one hand, there is a need for an open standard and a level playing field between different regions and sectors. And um, on the other hand, there's a need for a neutral and independent referee in case of disputes. And well, uh, since ELAT is a Dutch organization, and the Netherlands is part of the Europe. Um, we think there's a role for, in our uh, case, a European authority to oversee the governance of a PKI. Um, I think it, it should be wise that there uh, should also be an American authority or an Asian authority, but um, sorry, we, we uh, still as Dutch people have a focus on, uh, on Europe. So this slide is maybe a bit uh, too narrowly focused for a global, um, um, global platform. Um, but um, with the, the five steps we just uh, discussed, uh, we see a, a kind of market pathway. So at this moment, there's a one PKI consortium. This is where we are at this moment. And we're moving towards multiple P, uh, PKIs. Uh, and a next step might be when the, the, the PKIs uh, trust each other and start to, uh, to do the certificate trust lace, evolving in a walking chain of trust and maybe in a few years when uh, the market has really grown up and um, numbers are really big with the uh, European goals and the European Green, Green Deal, there will be a European um, uh, authority governing uh, all, all this. Um, what we see at this moment is uh, in Europe, um, is um, that at the ELAD roundtable I mentioned in Amsterdam, Charin took the initiative to install a PKI task force. And um, um, well, they're working hard on um, developing a template for a certificate policy, which contains the requirement with a sufficient level of security uh, in the context of ISO 1508. 
Uh, we also know um, at ALADS that in America, the Society of Automotive Engineers, the SEE, uh, plans to form um, uh, an industry-led pre-competitive uh, research project to strengthen electric vehicle charging system. Uh, but uh, we're not aligned at this, uh, this initiative, uh, so um, I, I can't uh, speak uh, for, uh, for the SEE. Um, and at ALAT, um, we're uh, trying to uh, prepare a demonstration of interoperable uh, PKI, which should be ready somewhere half June uh, in week 25. Um, we're working this uh, on this with parties in uh, Korea, France, Israel, Germany, and of course um, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, not only Elad, but also some uh, some market uh, player. So that's a demonstration of an interoperable uh, uh, PKI we're planning in um, in uh, June, mid June. Towards an open market, um, well, this is uh, the focus. We think that's very important to have, on the one hand, cybersecurity in place, but also um, uh, spur innovation. Uh, the market is not mature. So we need quality requirements, uh, but also market rules. Um, First thing is very important, balance in the market. It can be expected in our opinion that OEMs want to maximize the availability of charging stations for their specific drivers. So uh, Tesla drivers on Tesla chargers, uh, uh, Volkswagen uh, drivers on the Volkswagen uh, chargers, um, Renault drivers on Renault drivers. Uh, this is just an example. Um, because, well, with a large uptake of uh, electric vehicles, there might be a lack of uh, charging facilities um, in the uptake. However, at the same time, the OEM selects the PKI and determines its uh, terms and conditions. Uh, they're very, very big companies, uh, while the charge point operators in uh, the local market the Netherlands, Germany, France, but also uh, American states are often uh, small, player, small players. And there's an unbalance in the market and especially in the negotiation of power between the uh, OEM, the car manufacturer, and the local charge point operator. Um, and we should address this market imbalance and correct it by uh, market rules and correct governance. The second thing is we should create fair and reasonable conditions. Uh, large companies are investing in their own charging infrastructure. Uh, it can be OEMs or large energy companies because they want to move up in their value chain and they want to give discounts and privilege to, uh, to their customers that drive their vehicle brand or have their um, subscription by means of favoring a, a certain e-mobility service provider that is owned by the specific OEM or energy uh, supplier. But in a, a good market, consumers want to charge, in, in the Netherlands, uh, want to charge wherever they can. 70% um, of the Dutch people don't have their own driveway or don't have their own garage and they're depending, dependent on uh, public charging uh, infrastructure. Um, so interoperability is very, very important. And um, we should have a discussion on what um, uh, discounts or benefits or privilege uh, is fair and reasonable. Um, and also here, market rules and uh, governance, um, well, should be in place to, to 
stimulate innovation, improvement of service and price uh, um, pressure. It's in, in this competitive market, we should also keep in mind that it's uh, due to the recent economic downfall. Um, keep an open, open eye for small companies and startups uh, who are having a hard time, but who we need so much because they're so much more innovative uh, with their ideas in this uh, uh, market in the energy transition. Uh, so please don't lock them out or pre um, um, uh, prevent the lock-in of, uh, of cost uh, consumers. Um, consumers should have a choice uh, in our opinion. So the market rules in our opinion, uh, what should they be? Um, they should be trusted by all parties, uh, should be simple, um, uh, fast to be implemented or upgraded. As I mentioned before, the charging infrastructure of today will last probably for 10 years or 15 years. Um, but market rules uh, shouldn't cost too much uh, to set up or to maintain. And they should respect all legal requirements and create a level playing field. Um, be non-discriminatory uh, rules for participation in, in this market um, and be overlooked by a neutral authority, um, which also has an open mind for cross-sector collaboration. Um, so experience in automotive, in banking, in the internet and the energy. Uh, transition. Um, very important for us and at this moment we know there's a revision of the alternative fuel infrastructure directive and uh, at this moment cybersecurity is not really embedded um, in, in the drafts but um, it might be a good idea that um, commercial parties should ask the European Commission to have an open eye for a neutral, um, neutral authority. It can be a European, a, a, a Brussels authority, or it can be an authority between sectors, but let it be neutral uh, in our opinion. So back to the fun slides and uh, my conclusion. Um, an open market is very, very important. Um, as a grid operator, we have to facilitate uh, uh, the market, be non-discriminatory. Um, but as you've seen, uh, it works. Market rules needs to be transparent, trusted, safe, simple, fast, cost efficient. Um, and a PKI uh, bridges uh, both the open market and the cybersecurity, uh, because if uh, at attackers uh, uh, will come to our assets, uh, well, you can't go to work, but you will also damage uh, our goods. Uh, so uh, a good PKI for a, a smart charging is, is what we need. Thank you very much, uh, Miriam. Thank you, Bate. Thank you. Um, if the participants have questions, please um, uh, put them in the chat box and uh, I'll read them out. Uh, meanwhile, you mentioned a neutral authority that oversees the governance. Um, can you give an example from another sector of uh, if they had a neutral, a neutral authority, who was that authority and also <coughs> what did they do? Um, well, of course, many sectors uh, have, have neutral authorities, uh, sometimes um, um, organized by them, themselves, uh, sometimes um, um, regulatory boards. Uh, every country has a regulatory board for, for grid operators, uh, sometimes with a, a commercial perspective and sometimes in the Netherlands it's a, a governmental uh, uh, board. 
And I recall the, the webinar of last week where uh, Mike mentioned that the PKI uh, in airline industry is very mature, is a very international um, uh, operation. So yes, let's please learn from, uh, from other sectors where this is already in place. And I'm not sure if it's um, um, a govern, uh, governmental board or a United Nations board in the airline industry or um, um, between the actors. But um, uh, it was a clear success story, uh, Mike told us uh, last week. In the case of the EV ecosystem, we talked about large car companies and smaller companies like CPOs. If we do go the route of uh, uh, a neutral authority between the actors, do you think we can get to a, a really neutral authority where you have already a power imbalance because of the sizes of these companies? Uh, um, I can't say I think it, but I hope it. Um, uh, a cool thing of this time is that, uh, the, as I mentioned, the car is no longer a car, but it will also be a part of the energy system. And by, with bi-directional charging, uh, um, uh, I mentioned Sono Motors and Renault, um, you also not only have a, a power exchange between the grid charging, but also discharging, but also a financial transaction between the customer. If he charges, he has to pay, but if he discharges, uh, well, there's a business opportunity for new banking services. And um, well, I'm, uh, I'm a grid operator. So from a grid perspective, this, this is cool. Uh, but I'm also aware that this uh, transaction, this system shouldn't be governed uh, with an authority singly from grid, uh, grid operators. We should also have experience from banking sector energy, automotive involved, and, and of course, internet. But that you raised now, it's another complication of, we, we give the example of a regulatory board. In the case of, for example, the energy industry, okay, some of them, uh, like it's one industry, but now we're uh, talking about energy, transport, banking. So it is, it is complicated. Yes, but that makes it fun. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and, and I think um, uh, it would be one step too far uh, if the uh, European Commission or uh, um, uh, some governmental board in uh, America or Asia would say, okay, I'm going to organize it this way, the governance. I think it is very good that uh, parties like the SEE and uh, Charin are uh, setting first steps in uh, operating it. But please keep in mind that, uh, well, the SAE isn't uh, open, uh, an open platform. Uh, Charin is, well, sometimes a bit overly dominated by German automotive, while they also have players like Enel uh, involved. Uh, so we're getting there. Uh, um, there are good steps towards it, but uh, in our opinion, first we should really deploy an open platform for this with all different sectors uh, on board on the same uh, level playing field. What exactly, for example, Charen is doing right now? Uh, well, I'm feeling a need, so what, what is it they are doing? Um, well, we should ask that on, uh, on Charin, but uh, what I have under, uh, understand, and uh, some of my colleagues are also uh, helping, uh, uh, helping out a little bit, is that they're uh, developing a template for a certificate policy um, for uh, ISO 1511 8. But um, maybe it's a good idea to have a webinar uh, organized by Charin where they can, can uh, tell everybody also what state 
uh, status uh, they have. Okay, maybe we can approach them. Uh, and uh, is this is the SAE work compared uh, similar to what China is trying to do, or you don't know? This is such a new topic that we still don't have a full uh, um, knowledge of what's happening. No, I know. I know. Uh, I don't know this. Uh, the status uh, of the SEE, the Society of Automotive um, uh, Engineers. Yeah. Uh, so I can tell uh, about it, but I know they're they're active and um, well. They're also in America. There's a need uh, for a PKI for a smart charging. Okay. Um, uh the slide where you showed uh, the expected market pathway. Yeah. I can share it again. Yes, please. Oh. Computer program isn't. Almost there. Yeah. This one. <laughs> yes. OK. So uh, is interoperability uh, possible now? And is interoperability possible in all steps? Um, it's possible at step one. Um, so uh, the current situation. But when you get multiple, multiple PKIs, uh, then you lose interoperability. Uh, so well, what you try to, to do is to work toward uh, the European authority or the walking chain of trust when everybody talks to everybody. But uh, unfortunately, you probably uh, lose some interoperability in, in the steps two and three. Um, uh, so let, let's try to keep them as short as, uh, as possible. We must learn here from the lessons of uh, telecommunication, where it took a very, very long time to um, to have European roaming, for example. Okay. Um, okay, got the point. So now it's interoperable, but if we do go through this market pathway and go through multiple PKIs and certificate trust list, a trust list instead of just <coughs> into a walking chain of trust, we are going to lose interoperability. Yes, probably. Yes. Okay. Uh, and this, this is just an expected market pathway, yeah, uh, yeah. which we see. Yeah. Uh, uh, on this slide, you mentioned EVs are only allowed for five V2G routes and the multiple PKI option. Is this because ISO 151118 allows five V2G routes? Yes. Why yeah. is that bad? I think you mentioned it. Um, yeah, good point. Um, well, it... it, it <laughs> Uh, maybe it has to do, uh, I, I'm not an expert on 1511.8, nor am I on uh, an OEM uh, expert, uh, but it might have to do something with uh, the, the computer power uh, in the car. Um, so more computers make, uh, make a car uh, um, uh, more expensive. That, that would be a thing. And, and why they are very, limiting it, yeah. It, it would be a very bad thing if it would be intentional to, to well, um, create a lock-in uh, in the market. Um, and here we're creating a lock-in as in what? These cars are only able to speak to five different charging point operators? Yes, yes. Uh, um, well, uh, then, then you have a, a very small um, uh, value chain, of course. Um, like for example, a German, and this is an example, obviously, like a German car would only allow uh, five V2G routes of German uh, uh, roaming. Natural. Yeah, uh, with and we want to avoid competitors that. Or, yeah. um, um, or with an, a, a specific uh, energy supplier. And if you have bought a, a spe specific car brand, you can only use the energy of a specific energy supplier with it. Um, while if you at home uh, want to switch to a different energy supplier or a different e-mobility service uh, provider, um, well, 
the car can't support it because it only has the space of um, yeah. a limited number of, of routes. And um, well, in the end, as I mentioned, um, it, it won't be doable to have over a thousand or a million different CAs. That's why yeah. you have certificate trust list, but the number of five is, is a bit too limited. And um, well, we hope uh, this can be solved in the future. Um, With the walking chain of trust and the European authority. Exactly. Okay, yeah. and uh, you mentioned that uh, we could be locking small companies out by, for example, only allowing five V2G routes, and those companies don't have the power to say, I want to be one of those five. Yes, well, uh, keep in mind that um, uh, energy companies uh, are often very old, very big, a lot of uh, customers in the, in the Netherlands, all the grid operators together have over uh, 70 million uh, customers and OEM sells a lot of uh, uh, cars, it's heavily funded. Uh, but only 15 years ago, uh, Elon Musk was a, was a small startup with yeah. only a few Teslas and look where he's uh, now. And at this moment, uh, another example, uh, Sono is, is, is a cool car concept and I, I'm not sure if they're going to survive, but um they're they're pushing uh uh the market and it's very interesting uh the the model they're uh, producing and we should prevent well um a normal market um will turn out if they'll survive in uh, in in 10 years it shouldn't be that they're pushed out out of the market by traditional companies such as very old-fashioned companies which exist for over a hundred years, whether they're grid operators or energy companies or traditional OEMs. Okay. And um, um, are you like organizations, are they like say embracing ISO 1518 and collaborating to making it better? Uh, yes, but of course there are also other uh, uh, protocols in the market. Uh, a lot of Asian parties uh, still embrace uh, Chademo, of course. And, is is uh, Chademo secure now? Um, I'm, uh, uh, yeah, we should ask uh, uh, Chademo, but, okay. but I think they're, they're, of course, well, it's, uh, they'll, they'll have some, uh, uh, security um, uh, in it, of course. Uh, they're doing a lot of bi-directional charging as, uh, as well. Um, no, but uh, as, as grid operators, uh, we try to be non-discriminatory. Um, uh, and at this moment, uh, we think ISO 8 is very promising. It's a standard, it's not mature yet. Um, um, as mentioned uh, in the previous webinar by uh, um, Mike and Oscar, there's a lot of room for, uh, for improvement. We're not there yet, uh, but well, um, it, uh, that's also the room for improvement and we should do this together with different sectors. Yeah, okay, um, let's see. Uh, I have a couple of more questions on PKIs and I'm receiving questions on smart charging and in interoperability in the Netherlands. Are you happy to take these even though they're not directly uh, on PKI? Yes, yes, of course. So let's, let's talk a bit about the, um, uh, do, do you think we can run this PKI infrastructure as a non-profit way and all users pay a fee versus a commercial operation if we want our infrastructure to be secure? Um, uh, well, we shouldn't make this choice yet, whether okay. it's commercial operation or a, a profit. Of course, in, in uh, markets also differ. Um, in, I think in America, it, it would be more a commercial operation, while in Europe, there might be uh, some hands up for a, a non-profit uh, organization. 
uh, has to do something with the uh, um, American way of entrepreneuring and the European uh, way of uh, entrepreneuring. But maybe a commercial uh, operation also might be very good uh, in Europe, as long as it has clear market rules and a good governance. Okay. Um, who's, so we've had DigiCert uh, assessing ISO 151118, which is the front end part of things. Uh, but as we mentioned that security is a chain and it is as strong as the weakest link. So if we have a very strong front end, but we have a weak back end, then it's like, it's, it's not good. So who's assessing the, the back end of things and the overall system? Um, well, at this moment, we all do. Uh, there is no European authority or an American authority. And uh, I think that was very good of uh, ChargePoint uh, and DigiCert to, to have an assessment yeah. uh, of ISO 1511-8. Uh, uh, but as I mentioned before, um, uh, we must be aware that, e well, ELAT just uh, is in the market for, uh, for 10 years. Uh, E-mobility is in an uptake for the, five, uh, for the past five years. And cybersecurity is in focus for the past, well, two, one year. Um, and it, it's good that assessments such as DCCERT are done because we, we can learn from it. And uh, ELAT isn't telling that uh, all standards and protocols are mature yet, uh, but we shouldn't stop. Uh, and that's why we shouldn't stop at this moment because, well, e-mobility will be big and uh, we should in our opinion do this maturing improving together yeah. do, do, do you have examples of uh, charge point operators charging stations already embracing the PKI infrastructure uh, yes uh, what we try to do in the Netherlands is uh, the new tenders from 2020 and further on to have cybersecurity uh, requirements in them uh, because we, we convinced our uh, shareholders, our stakeholders, the municipalities and the provinces to have the um, cybersecurity specs uh, in the tender requirements. Okay, and you said the, um, uh, when is the event? You said mid-June, that's going to be online, I expect. Uh, yes, unfortunately, it has to be uh, online because we would be happy to invite you again at the Amsterdam Arena, but well, yeah. because of the virus, it will be uh, online. Uh, okay. And I think uh, um, we're on uh, public holidays uh, uh, this weekend, but um, uh, keep uh, social media uh, update dates uh, in mind because uh, my colleagues will say which date it will be uh, uh, probably somewhere around week 25 okay thank you two more questions if, the, if you have more time because we're already over four o'clock yes okay. sorry for that no no that, but quite the opposite i just wanted to make sure you're, you're okay on time um, yeah 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 with the pki for autonomous vehicles is this going a, a, a parallel route to pki for smart charging Considering that in the future, electric cars could, would be uh, autonomous? Um, we should certainly collaborate, uh, but uh, uh, I'm not an expert on uh, autonomous driving. And uh, I think the challenge, the challenge for uh, the charging of electric vehicles um, is slightly different than driving the electric vehicles in, in a safe way. Uh, charging um, the slides I mentioned, the car becomes a part of the energy structure, so it has to be intellect, interlinked with uh, energy suppliers, and banking, while driving the electric vehicle um, by driver or autonomous might have to um, interact with 
different sectors than energy and um, um, well grid operators. So we should align, but um, maybe uh, very close collaboration is a bit out of focus. Okay, thank you. And uh, the last question is on, uh, in general, on uh, the smart charging infrastructure in, in, in the Netherlands. So we are aware that in the Netherlands, um, uh, people mostly have access to, uh, uh, don't have access to private parking. Is that correct? Yes, yes. We're a densely populated uh, country in uh, 70, so 70% of our people don't have a, a private driveway or garage and they um, uh, rely on curbside parking yeah. and does need a public charger. So, so, so um, most of those residential chargers are installed uh, on the street. They are public. Yes, yes. What uh, is the percent from? and what is the percentage of these chargers that are smart chargers that allow the control to allow an organization to control the rate and the time of this charging event? At this moment, uh, I think, well, roughly 95% of um, chargers installed are smart chargers uh, because um, in, in the tender specifications, um, all municipalities and provinces are aware of the need for interoperability but also balance on the grid um, and services to to customers so charge when energy prices are low um, so 95 percent maybe 95 percent of your public chargers are smart already yeah yeah and uh, 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 do you think it helped greatly to coordinate the smart charging efforts by the Netherlands approach of adopting open communication protocols? And if that's the case, how did you manage to adopt one universal protocol to control chargers from 16 different operators or companies? I think you mentioned 16 at the beginning. Yeah. Um, well, uh, back in the early days, um, uh, we had a meeting in Rotterdam and uh, someone came with an electric car from Amsterdam, which is a drive of roughly uh, 70 kilometers. And he was r really glad he made it. Uh, those days we still had brain anxiety, but he couldn't, uh, and everybody was in the room, all the, the charge point operators by that time, but also representatives of all the bigger uh, municipalities. And he was really glad he made it and was so disappointed that he couldn't charge his Amsterdam vehicle in Rotterdam. And then, well, very Dutch, everybody in the room said, oh, this is, this is so bad for the rollout. Uh, we can be competitors, but this isn't pushing uh, the market. So uh, let's take some time, a year, two years, and we'll solve this. So the, the CPOs created a platform, it's called eViolin, uh, where they, uh, they are competitors, but they collaborate on issues where they shouldn't compete, but um, uh, help the, the market. A Dutch that's, approach. That's great. Yeah, that's, that's great. That, yeah. I'm just trying to think how it could happen in the UK. It's a different approach here. Most of the charging is, is, is at residential is home. So maybe yeah. uh, there's a much, um, it's di much more difficult to coordinate this compared to when you have this charging infrastructure installed directly to the network. Yeah, yeah but in the end, uh, it was also the carrot in the stick huh? um, uh, because in the same room uh, that, that day in, um, in the early days, also the municipalities mentioned, well, we'll give you a year or two uh, to solve this. And if you don't, we'll step in. And um, well, this is where, uh, this was also one of the questions, um, uh, should an authority be a, um, a commercial platform or run by commercial parties? Well, great. But if that doesn't work or you need an independent referee 
well, then it might be better to have a um, governmental or even a, a European or American um, uh, governance structure in place. So that's the stick. But first try to solve it together because real competition isn't about interoperability. People just want to have seamless charging anywhere. And in the end, um, uh, the charge point operators I talk to are very happy to facilitate the customers of their uh, competitors because they, they sell more uh, electrons in the end, maybe by a slightly uh, um, uh, smaller margin, but still they're very happy to, to serve other customers. Good. But thank you so much for your time and for the insights. I'd like to encourage people to check the ALAT website for some of the documents you make available and check social media for the events that you're making online. Uh, anything else you'd like to add before we close? Um, no, thanks for uh, everybody's uh, attendance and um, keep safe and uh, stay healthy. Thank you and hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.